Well, he was one of the announcers for the Skagit Dirt Cup last year, and he had a splendid time, and he tells us all about it. He's the voice of the Tezos All-Star Circuit of Champions Series. It's Blake Anderson. Blake, in this interview, tells us how he got his announcing start, some of his favorite things to do and follow while not racing, as well as some special moments from 2022. That's coming up next on Getting Up to Speed. Hello, I'm Ben Dethridge and I'm the host of Getting Up to Speed. We talk to sprint car drivers from the Pacific Coast, whether they race in Oregon, Washington, California. If they run it, we're going to talk about it. Also branch out a little bit as well as drivers that perhaps are from here that race elsewhere or some drivers that come in and try and take some money from the West Coast. In these episodes, we talk about past experience, past seasons, as well as upcoming races, as well as how's the season going. We hope you enjoy these episodes. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps us out. And stay tuned for more and more content. Now let's get in the interview. Well, on the phone with me, it's Blake Anderson, the voice of the Tezos All-Star Circuit of Champions Series. Blake, it's so great to talk to you. I know that we've messaged each other for several years, but we've never talked to each other. So, so hello, my name's Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on, Ben. It's exciting to be on your podcast. I know you've done a lot for racing in the Pacific Northwest and really kind of all over the place, seeing you on INCA TV the last couple of years. I know. And this is a little bit of a segue to what we're going to talk about. You were in my neck of the woods last year, and I wasn't. And I was in your neck of the woods, well, your original neck of the woods in Iowa last year, and you weren't around. So, hey, you never know. 2023 yeah. Dirt Cup, we might finally be able to cross paths physically. Yeah, I'm excited for Dirt Cup. It's, man, just this last weekend, we had some exciting announcements for Dirt Cup coming in June this year, which I think just kind of continuing to take things to the next level. So last year was your first year really ever being, you know, at the Pacific Northwest, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that was the first time I got to see a race in the Pacific Northwest, my second ever trip to the Pacific Northwest. So I was pumped. It's beautiful out there. It's a lot more different than home where Obviously, you know, Iowa flat, sure. cornfield and racetrack. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, some of the ones that I saw in Iowa, it's like, my goodness, if they had 410 sprint cars here, this would be incredible to see. You know, Marshalltown Speedway and Boone Speedway were the were the two, the only two that I went to so far, but I'm hoping to check off a couple more soon. Yeah, those are those are the two tracks I grew up going, up, going to, ironically, and the, Boone, the first one I announced that. So those are. Those two tracks are home and have a special place for me. Yeah, and I think your parents were there the final night of uh, the Super Nationals. Um, I yep. think Jay Van made an announcement. I'm, you know, oh, there's Blake, <laughs> there's Blake's parents right there, and I, I didn't, it didn't correlate to me quite, quite exactly at the time. And then you know, then they went ramp. Then Wade was like, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> Blake Anderson, you know. So then it all came together. Yeah, mom and dad, uh, dad, I don't. Boy, outside of just a year or two in there, my brother's playing college football. Hasn't missed the Super Nationals at Boone since 1988 when it went to Boone. So he's from Boone. It's a special place. And mom goes usually with him on Saturday night. And occasionally he'll get up to Boone through the year. They live about an hour away now, so not not too far. But, man, the Super Nationals are special. And uh, I got to go back two years ago for the first time in a decade. And it was amazing how much it had changed in that decade there from the mid nineties, 1994 to 2012, I never missed one. And so sure. it was weird not going for a decade and then getting back and seeing how much that place had changed and the event itself had changed is, is pretty darn cool. So for those of you that are listening and wondering what in the world are we talking about? The IMCA super nationals is about a week long race at Boone Speedway in Boone, Iowa. And it features all of the IMCA classes except for race saver sprints they have their own deal at Eagle Raceway in Nebraska and the IMCA Southern Sport Mods have their own deal in Texas Oklahoma but last year I think it was 1,063 cars total I mean just just incredibly nuts if you like racing um, it it's it's an incredible event to go to yeah it is it's they keep the event rolling too it's like one of one race rolls on and as you know Ben before that next before that last race is off the racetrack, the next one's rolling onto the racetrack, getting the one to go signal. So they, they crank the races out. But when you have a thousand entries, as you said, you can't waste time. You have sure. to keep the hammer down because otherwise you're going to be racing until the sun comes up. <laughs> exactly. Which, which has happened before. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, uh, getting back to, to sprint car things, uh, 
you and you and racing, how, how did that involvement start? How, how did that, uh, how did that addiction begin? At Boone Speedway, ironically. Okay. My dad, uh, as I said, he grew up in Boone. The Ford dealership across the street from the racetrack was in our family for a while, and they oh, sponsored right. a car out there that raced weekly in Greg Davis. And I started going there when I was little. Dad started taking me, and I got an opportunity in 2005 to start announcing there. Toby Cruz, that was a longtime announcer, actually went to work for IMCA and was gone a lot. So I got to work with Denny Grabenbauer, and you want to talk about the most patient guy in the world is Denny Gravenbauer, right? I mean, to teach me how to announce he and Toby, and I can still hear to this day Denny behind me. And this is before broadcast. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just when you're announcing to the crowd. can still hear him. Okay, keep talking. Keep talking. You know, you got to keep talking. Sure. Keep explaining what's happening. I can still hear that. And you know, looking back, what is now 18 years ago, it's hard to believe. That uh, that paid dividends and pays dividends to this day because now I'm not just talking, as you know, Ben. You, you, you're part sure. of broadcast not just talking to the fans and the grandstands, you're talking to almost pretty much every night, a larger audience watching on the broadcast and they can literally hear every word where in the grandstands, they can usually only hear you when it's downtime. Sure. So that's where it started for me. And then in college, I got an opportunity at Knoxville Raceway, my freshman year of college. And I took that, I was there for four years with a year at USAC in between that. And then after college, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina and worked for the World of Outlaws, but I worked in the office at World Racing Group. So I wasn't on the road, wasn't announcing, just announcing a couple of races a year for the guys at the Cushion, which is a blast. Really enjoyed working with those guys. And 2015, got an opportunity with the All-Stars to do our announcing and marketing and our website stuff. And here we are. This is our ninth season with the series, and I can't believe I'm still doing this. That's awesome. And, and you do a plethora of other things, too, outside the All-Stars as well. Yeah, pretty much every sprint car race over at Eldor Speedway, I'm, I work. And then the Flow Racing Night in America stuff last year, I got an opportunity to pit report those races, and I'll be doing that again this year. Not sure on the couple at the end of the year, but at least every one of them through the summer and into the early fall. And then the Chili Bowl, the Gateway Dirt Nationals, and there's a handful of other events as well that I get to do, but uh, those are kind of the highlights. And I enjoy I, – I, I enjoy getting to work at different events because, as you know, it's a unique, different challenge to sure. do a different set of cars than what you get used to, and it kind of pushes you outside of the box. And you get to hear other guys work, too, and see how other guys do their job, and which, which I really enjoy. But the older I get, the more I feel, man, I don't have to do maybe every race yeah. on the earth where five, eight years ago, you know, you're in your 20s, I felt like, man, I got to be doing 100 races a year there was a couple of years in college i did 120 races mm -hmm. which it worked out i mean that was the whole point of it was to get my name out there and it worked and now i kind of feel like i enjoy being home a little bit more and relaxing more than being at the racetrack every single night i can be at the racetrack well and i think you gave some excellent advice for people that want to strive to to do broadcasting for a living and everything is don't be afraid to to explore other options you know like you said you you worked with uh, world racing group and you weren't on the announcing side of things but you build that skill set you build that you know that toolbox to where that you're you know you you create you know your stock rises and your value increases the more that you're able to do absolutely and that's i mean i i still remember when i started doing sprint cars my dad told me to keep doing the modified stuff mm -hmm. because you never want to close the door and I don't want to be just pigeonholed as oh he's a sprint car guy and sure. I kind of get that a little bit now because I announced for the all-stars but I love going to modified races I love announcing modified races I love working late model races I just love race cars so I enjoy getting to do the different things but yeah for the young announcers out there that want to do the the, the stuff that you and I get to do as announcers I cannot stress the the importance of just going out and being seen at the racetrack I mean mm -hmm. my freshman and sophomore year i was lucky because i got to travel with jerry van sickle my freshman sophomore year of college i went with jerry every single night i could if, even if i wasn't announcing just to be seen walking in the pits creating those connections meeting new people go to I, I go to as many races as you can at that young age to just get your name out there and, and people start to to recognize you and that for that once that happens the snowball really starts to get moving yeah oh totally you know you know don't restrict yourself to um, you know, like you said, sort of a one trick pony or typecast is a certain deal. Like, you know, I get, I get flicked a lot of stuff all the time. Why are you talking about formula one or whatever? You just never know, right? You never know who's, yeah. who's watching or listening, but I've realized that, you know, Peter Murphy 
inside scoop here. He's a huge Formula One fan. And, yeah. And, you know, like I showed up wearing like a Mercedes, you know, team shirt. And he's like, oh, roll it on, Mike. You know, you know, Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. Yeah, you know, like, you know, they're, they're cool and stuff. But, you know, I like, um, you know, I like, uh, uh, you know, like these guys, like Jackie Stewart and, and, um, and Jim Clark and everything. Oh man, you know, that's, you're talking old school. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like it's propelled our relationship. And, you know, some of the things I do, I've been, in, in, you know, Martin Brundle is very good at what he does. And, um, you know, the F1 broadcast team is just sensational. And I, I just, I just take things from them too. So. There are a few broadcasts in racing that I enjoy more than an F1 broadcast. From the start, from the Gridwalk show leading into the broadcast, they cover it so well, and it comes so so naturally to me, those Gridwalks. Like, it doesn't feel forced when he's out there walking the grid and just talking and st- stopping and talking to random stars, Yeah, which I think is really, really cool. And that's something that we've kind of implemented into our broadcast a little bit with the grid walk. I haven't done it for a couple of years at Kings Royal, but the pre-race grid walk that I did at Kings Royal a couple of years, I think, you know, that kind of derived from that F1 format of we're just going to walk the grid, talk about the guys as they're strapping into the cars. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I will say in, I'm a little jealous of them. They only have to worry about, you know, 20 guys, you know, yeah. unless there's a, unless there's a driver change, you know, they put a reserve driver or anything, but you know, they, you know, it's pretty, it's not like our sport where, um, and what's unique yeah. about it when I like about it too, is you never know who's going to show up. Like, you know, who the core guys are that are going to are following certain series, certain tracks, but when it comes like dirt cup, who the heck's going to show up, you know, some guy might just get a wild hair and toe from, you know, the Midwest and, and race that event. Yeah, that was, Dirt Cup was a challenge for me this year because I had never been out there. So I, I knew, like, really knew, obviously, the guys that were kind of the staples of the King of the West, you know, the arc sprints that were coming up in, in Skagit. But it was the the weekly guys that just are grinding it out that really make Skagit the guys that you grow to appreciate that I didn't know quite as well. And I quickly learned them. And that was fun, and Caleb was great to work with. He was a huge help in getting me pre- prepared to work that event, so I appreciate that. But I cannot wait to get back this year and, and see how those guys have progressed, especially at Skagit with them putting more emphasis on the four times. I think they're running 12 or 13 nights this year, which is just awesome. Yeah, and, and it's it's totally cool because most places, once they – put the kibosh on it like it doesn't come back you know we've seen yeah we've seen racetracks you know get rid of a 360 or get rid of a 310 or, or the 410 pardon me and you know it's hey this is just what we're going to do if that and then to see sort of like it going back that's 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 wonderful that you know growth we always want to see that yeah you're exactly right Ben. once you kind of see those classes disappear you don't expect to ever see them again and i don't know if the four tens would ever be back there if it weren't for Pete and Kevin Rudine and the, and John Hager and the gang that they have in place up there at Skagit. You know, Pete is, as you know, I don't know if there's anyone quite on the West coast that pushes four tens as hard as him with really pushing them to come back in California and then taking up that up to Washington at Skagit where Kevin is very passionate about bringing the four tens back and you pair that together. And boy, Dirk cup this year is last year, the crowd, talking to people they said it was as big as it's been in a decade mm-hmm. and i think it's going to be even bigger this year especially with the expanded purse oh totally totally and you know and you have guys that will be having local guys have more 410 experience which will make the field yep. better i mean it's a win-win for everybody it is and which is great that's such a cool place i got to spend being in washington this past weekend for some their advertisers dinner John, I was with John Hager, who is the general manager out there. He's going to hate that I call him that, but that's what he is. So we give him a hard time for it. Uh, I spent some time with John, and uh, we went out to the racetrack, and I got to walk around as they were in meetings. And just the improvements that are coming there are pretty darn impressive. And it's, boy, you race fans in the Pacific Northwest are in for a treat, really, in the coming years, because they've got some stuff rolling this year that won't be completed until 2024. But you're not going to recognize Skagit in the near future, and it's going to be fantastic. It's going to create for a great fan experience, that's for sure. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, and last year was my first year ever going there, and I was just taken aback because, for whatever reason, just the stars didn't align to where that I could make it to a race there. And I, 
made it to their midseason championship, and then I came a couple, uh, come back a couple weeks later for, um, you know, our Speed Week Northwest started up there, and then I came back for a, actually I had a ten thousand dollar to win modified show there, IMCA sanctioned, and just every time I go, it's like wow, like I I pinch myself not to take anything away from any racetracks that I went, but you know, yeah. it's just one of those things. It's like a you know a pilgrimage to Mecca or something or to Jerusalem. Like holy smokes, like I'm really here. Like this is something as a little little kid. It, you know, like for people in the Midwest to go to Knoxville, for people on the East Coast to go to Eldora, you know, some, something of that nature. Absolutely. And that's what they're striving to do is exactly what you just said, make it to the point where it is Skagit Speedway is that destination. And boy, some of the massive improvements that they have in the works here that you'll see this year and the next year are absolutely going to make it that kind of destination racetrack in the Pacific Northwest. And no doubt, and and uh, you know, you see, unfortunately, some racetracks, you know, falling apart or not opening. COVID took a massive hit, but you see the complete opposite to to a venue like Skagit or to you know venues like Silver Dollar Speedway, where you know you get these aggressive improvements put in, which is going to make everything better, and I think will rub off on other racetracks, um, you know, to to get either, you know, a limited schedule put together, a full schedule put back together, or their facilities upgraded also. Exactly. And it's, dirt track racing is in a good spot right now, and hopefully we can continue to grow it. And I know for the fans in the Pacific Northwest specifically, you know, Skagit and Elma haven't worked together in, in a while. They've kind of mm-hmm. you know, they've raced against each other, and I know this year that's going to change, and they're going to work with Elma, and Elma's going to work with Skagit, and I think that's only going to make racing – in that Washington area stronger. If you can get those two racetracks working together like they are to kind of, we're all pulling on the same rope and they finally realize that. So that's fantastic news for the race fans up in that Seattle area. Well, and what's really cool is to see, um, and this is goes for sort of on a national scale of, um, somebody put a graphic courtesy of Wikipedia of, you know, the big, paying sprint car races and it's going mm-hmm. up and it's great. And, and, and not just, is it going up? It's paying through the field really well too. I should note that, that that's just as important. 24th place is just as important as first place. And those B main cars, C main cars are just as important as the guy that finishes number one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's something that tracks are starting to grasp as everyone rolls to the gates. It's just as important. It is important as the next guy, you know, even if they've never made an A main or not, we, we need everyone to continue to grow this thing. So that's exciting. And the car counts up in the schedule area are on the rise. And I think you're going to see much of the same this year. As you mentioned that graphic, I think with the update going to 62,000 to win for the dirt, super dirt cup next year, it's going to be like the sixth highest paying yeah. four ten sprint car race in the country next year. The weekly four ten purse at Skagit is like, the third highest weekly purse in the country. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. When you think a decade ago, they were paying like 1400 to win. Mm-hmm. Now they're paying four grand to win. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And about a decade ago, they were about to, you know, you know, pull the plug on the whole operation for four ten. So, um, yeah, you know, it miracles can happen, right? <laughs> they can, they can. Hey, I gotta say though, one of my favorite things of seeing you, um, a couple things, but one, one for sure is, was a flow night deal. I think it was the peach state classic at Sonoy last had to been October or so late in the year. And, and Michael Rigsby and the guys in the studio were unveiling the Lucas oils late model schedule. And I just remember the, the silence from you of just the purses that were being unleashed, you know, 30, 30, 40, 50, 100, 150, you know, to win all this stuff. But it's cool to see that sprint car racing is going in that direction as well. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, I was, I was blown away by that. I mean, just sure. as you said, the Lucas schedule is just like one twenty to $25,000 to win race after another. Now, and the only difference, a large difference between our purses and late model purses is a lot of times the sprint car races probably pay a little bit better to start because I know like this year, for example, the World 100 is paying like 5,300 to start. Mm -hmm. I think it is 53, 56 right in there. That's the highest paying late model race ever to take the green flag. Well, the Knoxville Nationals is paying 15 grand to take the green flag this year. Sure. So 
I mean, that, that's, that's a bit of a difference there. But, yeah. boy, late model fans are also staunchly loyal. They're a lot more loyal, and, and they're not as fickle as our sprint car fans. I mean, they can have – but there's more late models around the country. You know, you know, there's thousands of super late models, and there's maybe 250, 410s. But late models can have two or three 50 grand to win races on a weekend, and every one of those racetracks is, A, going to be packed, and B, going to have 50 cars, where, boy, if we have 50 grand to win, it's, one of them's going to lose out pretty sure. big so sure. we're getting there though we're yeah. getting there so yeah. it, we're taking positive steps in the sprint car world so that's encouraging no and i th- I feel like there's just this unison lately i don't know if that was a covid thing or just you know divine intervention or what exactly but every everywhere across the country seems to be like a unified like none none of these funky region specific rules if you get where i'm coming from yeah that you look at the late models going to the unified tire sprint car roofs are going to do similar thing this year and that's only going to help. And I think that's always been a big advantage to the four tens over the three sixties is you could unroll, you could roll your car out on Friday in California, run it. And especially now five years ago, you had to just change a tire, mm-hmm. but now Friday in California, run it, run Saturday at Knoxville and run Sunday at like that's motor speedway in PA. Mm-hmm. I know not physically possible, but sure. in theory <laughs> you could run the same exact car and not have to change anything in a four ten. where three yeah. sixties. That's not always been the case. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of like a, all, a IMCA sort of deal. You can, you know, you can run Marshalltown, you can run Boone, you can go to Benton County, you know, wherever you want to, wherever you want to go. Same exact car. Yep. Same exact car. Don't have to change the gear. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly, exactly. Speaking of Benton County and Benton, the the home of IMCA, Mm -hmm. we got to get like a 410 race there too. I know some people, but my, that thing would, that place would be rocking and rolling, I think. I think the only thing that holds a lot of those places back back home is they're just not quite safe enough or up to our standards in sprint car racing that sure. we would need like an all-star race. Cause, but they, they've never really had to be because they're running modifieds and that's nothing against the modifieds, but they don't usually need me, you, know, you know, cables through the fencing be, like sure. at Boone Speedway because they're not really ever going to get a modified up there or, you yeah. know, Marshalltown with the pavement walls that make you a little bit nervous if it's a sprint car. But you're exactly right. In theory, if we could magically drop a hundred grand or a quarter million bucks in these places and get them ready to run a sprint car race, oh my God, would it be fantastic! <laughs> It'd be awesome. You imagine it uh, as you as you said, a three race weekend through Marshalltown Friday, Boone Saturday, and then over to Benton on Sunday. That would just be it bonkers. Yeah. All right. You know, no more races the rest of the year. Nothing's going to top that. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Exactly. That three race swing right there. And you're, and you're in Iowa and you're not even touching Knoxville yet. Sure. And that's your three race swing and it's going to be incredible. Sure. The other thing I was going to tell you that really impressed me, was the, the gateway nationals this last year at, you know, the dome of uh, the final night, you know, Tyler Irby wins and, and you can just kind of tell that something, something's a little off and everything, the way that you conducted yourself in that interview when he, you know, told the entire, the entire world that, you know, his dad had passed away Wednesday and everything, just the way you were able to control that interview and keep everything going. I, I just got to commend you of just, um, you know, top shelf quality job. I appreciate that. And I certainly, I, one, had no idea that happened. I, I sure. didn't have the slightest idea. I could just tell, you know, obviously something's a little off. I know Tyler fairly well, too. But uh, I didn't maybe want to push. I didn't want to push him too hard. And sometimes I maybe, I'm glad it didn't come off that I was pushing hard yeah. to get the reason. But I, I thought it was definitely absolutely worth mentioning because usually Tyler, you know, is, <laughs> yeah. especially when in 30 grand, it's going to be, it's going to be a party and it wasn't a party. So I just, I wanted to know like what, what was going on there. And I, it was cool that he felt ready to do to announce that, but I'm glad to hear that it didn't come off the wrong way on my end. I I really appreciate that. No, no. It's one of those things where, you know, you kind of, you know, doing infield interviews, it's tough. You know, you got a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. going on. You're dealing with all sorts of emotions. One guy might want to kill the other. The other one's celebrating. The other one's mad at himself. You know, um, it's, you feel like a, a, almost like a therapist for a minute there, but, but uh, yeah. You know how tough it can be because you, everyone's like, well, you don't stick a mic in a guy's face right out of the crash. And I get that. It's a fickle line to play in because you got to get the interview. Correct because you're working the broadcast but at the same point you don't want to you want to make sure the guy's got his wits to him as well that he didn't just get his bell rung so you really got to be able to feel a situation out and 
kudos to Ben and DJ for allowing me a lot of the signs of the dome to feel some situations out before they just throw it down to me and, sure. and throw me, uh, throw me to the wolves. They let me kind of walk around, feel it out. Okay. Is this an interview that we're able to do? Or yeah, Hey, I don't know if we're going to want to do this interview right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, winter nationals last year, there was a guy that went through a billboard basically. And like, he was, uh, I think he was just his plane was landing in Georgia or something <laughs> in his mind because um, yep. I'm like, hey, wave this off. But but you know, it's just one of those things like, hey, you know, okay, I don't think you you know, do you want to do an interview? No, not really. Okay, sounds good. I'll let him know. But it's okay to say, you know, are you okay? Anything you want me to tell people? You know, obviously, you know, one guy told me you can tell that guy that he can, you know. <laughs> not send me a Christmas card. I'm just you yeah, know, <laughs> you know, ch- changing names and scenarios for for protective purposes. <laughs> yeah, that's I don't blame you there. Yeah, that's uh, you get that though. It is guys crash. Some guys are really really calm, and other guys they wear their emotions on their sleeve, which is the beauty of our sport as well. Sure. sure. Oh, completely, completely. Yeah, it's uh. You never know what you're going to get. That's the that's the beauty of dirt track racing. That's a fact. I mean, I know that sounds cliche, but it's very, very true. Yeah, yeah. It, you, you roll up, and it's going to be like, oh, man, it's going to be hammered down, and then it's, you know, blowing dust or vice versa, you know? <laughs> and boy, do we see that a lot in Ohio. It's tough to read those tracks in Ohio because of that and because the, the uh, soil just does not hold the moisture like it does in Iowa or out in California where – I mean, I've seen it rain at, at tracks in Ohio, and we're blowing dust in hot laps. Just, yeah. And the fans immediately want to say, oh, they what, they lose the keys to the water truck? <laughs> Man, you could water these places until you're blue in the face, and they're going to blow dust. And a lot of times when you throw water on it before a feature, it makes it worse yeah. for the first five or six laps until the track can clean off. So I think uh, that's kind of one of the more frustrating things my job is seeing when we're at Speed Week, and the people are like, oh, they lose the keys to the water truck? Yeah. <laughs> no, they've been... <laughs> They've been watering for six days. It just sure. the dirt here doesn't hold moisture like it does in Iowa, like it does in California. You know, it's mm-hmm. just it's a very it's a silty dirt. It's a different surface. Sure, sure. We've talked about what you're going to be doing for 2023. Obviously, Dirt Cup is on the radar there, but uh-huh. you've started your 2023 season. Chili Bowl obviously has came and went, um, and then the Florida Swing. Everything going okay so far? Feeling good. Yeah, Chili Bowl went great. It's a quick week. It, it, you get there on Sunday and you feel like, oh, man, this is a bear. And it is a little bit of a bear because it is a long week. Mm-hmm. But, boy, you get to, it's like you blink and it's Wednesday and then you blink again and you're Friday night and you're getting ready for Saturday. Sure. And it goes so quick. And then Florida, kind of the same this year. We got cut short a little bit with not going to Sonoy because of Mother Nature. So hopefully Mother Nature can can be kind next year because Sonoy looks so cool. Yeah. But the racing at East Bay and at Volusia was fantastic. And then leaving from there and going to Skagit and getting excited for what's to come there. It's hard not to be really, really excited about what dirt track racing as a whole has coming this summer for the race fans, whether you're a subscriber on speed sport flow or dirt vision, excited or the cushion and exciting stuff coming this year. Yeah. And for you, you got a little bit of a break to kind of rest and get ready for the big spring push yep i'm off until now i'm off until we race in early april that'll be my next race it's the seventh and eighth at attica those are our points openers then i have a couple flow racing night in america races and then in may we really pick back up with the all-stars which has been a bit of a change usually we kind of pick up in april and go but boy the last five years i bet our batting average is 500 at best Mm -hmm. in april And with the Outlaws being around the Midwest, instead of being in California, we're going to allow our teams to go race with them and they can go to Knoxville and run or they can go to Pennsylvania. So giving them even more freedom than we already do and and just hoping maybe when we pick up in the second week of May that we'll be full steam ahead. Yeah. Awesome. And I, you know, for people that don't know, Blake is a huge Iowa sports fan. Have you been, have been keeping up on your sports so far? I have. I, I had to miss the basketball game last night, which is probably for the best because they didn't play very well because I was flying back home from, from Seattle last night. But uh, it's basketball season. It's wrestling season. Our wrestling team's number two and basketball team looking to be uh, in the tournament. I don't know, five to five to eight seed, depending on how these last four games go in the Big Ten tournament. So I'm good there. And then uh, 
then it's racing season once the NCAA tournament hits until the first weekend of September when Iowa football starts and I'm probably a little bit too invested in that. <laughs> well, that's cool that you're in Iowa wrestling. That's, that's super yeah. cool because for folks that don't know, you know, I know that there's a lot of IMCA guys that follow Iowa wrestling a lot, but, uh, it is definitely Dan Gable is, you know, like the Admiral. Uh, I think the only person I could think of, and this is totally like wrestling nerd stuff. Cliff Keen with Michigan is the only other influential. Oh, John Smith with Oklahoma state too. Yeah. But, uh, you know, holy cow, that guy and what he was. And here's the, here's the factoid. He did not wrestle for Iowa. He wrestled for Iowa state. No one loss. He went undefeated in high school and lost his last match ever at Iowa state. And, and was coaching at Iowa State before the Iowa job offered, and that's when he created, I mean, geez, they've won now 25 national championships since the late 70s, and it's been tough the last decade. They've only won a couple national championships, which, I mean, that, boy, does that sound elitist saying that. But <laughs> yeah. growing up in Iowa, I mean, it's hard not to follow Iowa wrestling because they are the golden standard in that sport. And I, I grew up a basketball guy. I mean, I love basketball. If you're going to put mm -hmm. basketball and wrestling side by side, I'm going to pick basketball. Sure. 10 out of 10 times, but I really enjoy, I've grown to enjoy wrestling and getting to know it more the last probably five or eight years of a little bit better understanding, just the intensity of it. I really, really enjoy that. And hopefully they can, uh, hopefully they can maybe pull an upset here in a couple of weeks in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma and pick up a national championship. Well, here's a crazy thing for you. You mentioned one loss. I think it was only loss ever. He never lost in high school. Never, you know, Correct. As, as an Olympian, he never lost as an Olympian. Um, talking about Dan didn't give Gable. up a point and his one and only loss 1970 world final or, you know, national championships. I think I got the year, right? Larry, yep. Larry Owings university of, Washington, Washington, yeah. yep. and actually Larry Owings is from Oregon. So, you know, it's like, it, wow. What are, what's the irony there? If you have a flow racing subscription, there's a fantastic documentary on Gable and really leading into that Larry Owings loss that they did. I don't know, a year or two ago turned out really, really good that I enjoyed. I mean, I enjoyed watching that, but it was some Dan Gable stuff and he is a God in Iowa. I mean, there's a reason we have a statue out in front of Carver Hawkeye arena because sure. He is a huge, I mean, he still goes to almost every duel in Carver. You see him a lot back home. I mean, I was shopping at the grocery store a year and a half ago and I was back home with my buddies, I think it was for the NCAA tournament. So it had been two years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's Dan Gable right there, grocery shopping. Sure. So it's like, wow. and he still is recognized and he still holds, he's, he is, as I said, he's a god back home, that's for sure. Well, and I've always looked at, you know, I did wrestling as high school. You know, I didn't do, I, the only thing I did with basketball was announce games and everything. Just again, expanding my, you know, arsenal mm -hmm. of, of, you know, things I can do, but I really associate it with racing because you never know when you're going to get hot. You never know when you're going to win matches and you never know when that streak is going to lose. Like one day everything can go perfect. It's like, wow, I did. I felt like I didn't train that hard this week. Like I, you know, I'm just winning. And then there's other days I can't even, you know, touch my face with my own hands. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> so, very humbling yeah, boy, sports. Is that not the truth? I mean, I didn't wrestle, but, boy, I can imagine that. Yeah, much like racing, yeah, you never know when the tide is going to turn. Sure, sure, yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, the, I, I could go on about, like, you know, cutting weight five days a week, lifting weights, you know, <laughs> working out three hours a day for one match for one week and you lose, there's nothing more yeah. dis disappointing or makes you angrier than, than that. So, um, you know, but also to lose with grace and be like, okay, I just got to work harder. So that's the beauty of it. That's uh, that absolutely is uh, so cool. And it, you said much like racing, you know, there's a lot of guys, they invest their entire week in the shop for, one night of racing, whether it's a sprint car or a modified mod light or a Hornet, you know, they're, they're all in. And when you don't win, I can imagine that's, that's tough to take. Sure. Sure. I mean, you could, you know, throw a fit and freak out or just realize, okay, what did I do wrong? And just build off of that. So and go to work and go to work. Yeah. Don't do it again. So yeah. Roll the sleeves up. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Blake, it's been great getting known you and uh, having a chance to talk with you. Before I let you go, though, is there any people that you want to thank um, or acknowledge before uh, we wrap things up? I mean, that's uh, our team with the All Stars. We've got a great team, and it really makes working here enjoyable. I mean, we really have kind of 
a family atmosphere with our with our group of employees. Our I don't know, there's ten of us now, maybe you know, four, three of us full time, and we got seven contractors that come to every race and makes it enjoyable to be at the racetrack. We've got a hardworking group and just a good core group of racers that run with us too that make the race is a blast most nights you know there, there's always those nights where you're as you know ben you're pulling your hair out not every night can go perfect you right. hope they all can but when, sure. you, when you run 60 races a year they're not gonna you're not gonna hit 60 home runs that's for yeah. sure so we just hope we can hit 40 and that's uh, that's all right too but no i just uh in the fam obviously you know the cliche the family my parents couldn't to they've really helped me get to where i am because they put a lot on much like racers do you know, for their kids, my parents did much of the same for me to, to help me be able to get as much experience as I could, especially through college when, you know, trying to bounce being a full-time student and call races a couple hours away. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's been enjoyable. I'm looking forward to what might po- quite possibly be our first face-to-face meeting. We'll have to grab a hot chocolate or something at Skagit Speedway on one of yeah, the nights. Absolutely. Of so. We'll we'll be there. I can't I cannot wait for Dirt Cup. I was just just yesterday on my flight back working with John and trying to figure out what day I'm going to come out to Dirt Cup this year. If I'm going to hopefully make it for the Tuesday opener this year. Last year was on Monday. This year it's on Tuesday. So awesome. They have that preload to the Dirt Cup. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and we'll be talking soon. All right. Thanks, Caleb. Appreciate it. All right, Keith, Caleb. Thanks, Ben. Caleb on my mind working with him at Skagit. No, <laughs> it's okay. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this latest episode of Getting Up to Speed with me, Ben Dethridge. We hope you enjoyed this program. We hope also that you hit the subscribe button and the like button as that really helps things out, spreads things out. Be sure and share as well on social media so that more people can listen to these great interviews and from these great drivers. Getting Up to Speed is a production of High Side Racing Promotions. For more information, you can check it all out on Facebook, High Side Promotions.